1963, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech to a crowd of freedom walkers in Washington, D.C. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That speech changed the civil rights movement and the hearts and minds of Americans across the nation. But before that speech, there was a dress rehearsal of sorts in Detroit. As I participate with you in what I consider the largest and greatest demonstration for freedom ever held in the United States. It's been 57 years since that iconic speech, and the nation continues to struggle to fully realize the dream of Dr. King. Are you prepared to take the oath, Senator? I am. And even when it appeared to I be Barack within reach. Hussein. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. The idea of unity, equity, and justice for all has found it difficult to escape the icy grip of systemic racism, indifference, and injustice. But as a nation, we march on. And as the steps toward equality continue to be painful, we march on. Even when that blinding light of the beacon of hope dims, we march on. And that tiny spot on the globe that's the latitude and longitude of a place called Detroit, even when we feel lost, we have a place to find our true spirit. And we are renewed to continue the march balance the scales of justice and chase the dream. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Kimberly Gill. I'm Devin Skilly and tonight we continue the conversation that has taken hold in cities large and small all across the country. We hope to look at solutions to a problem that has plagued our nation from its very beginning. And we are very honored to have Martin Luther King Jr's son Martin Luther King III join us for a candid conversation. We have local four team coverage beginning with our co hosts Rhonda Walker and Everard Casimi live from the Henry Ford. Good evening. Well, good, good evening to you, Kimberly and Devin. We are live. This is the With Liberty and Justice for All exhibit inside of the gorgeous Henry Ford Museum, a place in our community where we can all learn about the fight for civil rights. Yeah, and this bus is an iconic example. Many believe Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat to a white man was an act that sparked the civil rights movement. Tonight, we are going to get personal. You're going to hear from mothers and fathers who struggle with how racism affects their own children and how to have that difficult talk with your children, something that I'll eventually have to do with my two sons. Absolutely. We're also going to talk about the next generation, find out how they're feeling and what they think needs to be taught in schools. And that is just the beginning. Paula Tutman, Victor Williams, and Larry Spruill will all be joining us live as well. If you've ever paid attention to the plaques on the rocks on this Stonehenge kind of sculpture in Hart Plaza, you get a real sense of Detroit history, like this one right here that commemorates that march on that great day. And that's where our stories begin live. Victor? I'm Victor Williams, and it's a call to action to have more African-American representation in the classroom. I have the opportunity to speak to an educator who's known all across the country, and here's what he has to say that's going to make a very big difference in the way our children see themselves. Larry? And I'm Larry Spro, and I talk to two local businessmen about what's been going on here in the country. They also tell me what they feel needs to happen in order to move forward. Kimberly Devin? All right, Larry. Well, the marches, protests and demonstrations over police brutality and racism continue as we commemorate the 57th anniversary of the Detroit Walk to Freedom. The question is, can this latest movement bring about real change this time? And maybe the best place to start that conversation is by looking at how we got here tonight. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Thomas Jefferson, 1776 the great American birthright, and yet written by a slaveholder, written nearly a hundred years before slavery could be abolished. It is the American wound that refuses to heal, perhaps because it's never really been bandaged properly. The stitches split wide open again as the spring of 2020 rolled into view. As the coronavirus deaths began to accumulate, a glaring pattern quickly began to emerge. The virus was killing African-Americans at an astounding rate. 
And away from the hospitals, the virus was also infecting the economy, putting it, too, on life support. Communities of color were now gasping for life in one way or the other or both. The kettle was at a full boil, and then George Floyd found himself gasping for breath beneath the knee of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, the last breaths he would ever draw. For only the millionth time, black Americans had had enough. And yet, this time, enough turned out to be an awful lot. Massive American upheaval. Yes, the message got clogged at times, looters and vandals on one side, and on the other, some police officers who seemed intent on living down to the protesters' expectations. And now we hear of commitment to change from police, from business leaders. We hear updated takes on everyone from Colin Kaepernick to Aunt Jemima. And yet, you must be forgiven if your skepticism overrides the hope for meaningful change. It was 1971 that Marvin Gaye sang of too many men dying and too many mothers crying. And nearly 50 years later, we still ask, what's going on? Now, the list of ingredients in this crisis is quite lengthy. But let's now take a look at one that is so often mentioned, but not as often understood. You're right, we're talking about systemic racism. It shows up across systems in our community, such as education, the criminal justice system, employment, and housing. And as far as housing goes, you need look no further than what happened right here in Detroit. Historically speaking, owning a home is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But that opportunity was not always available to blacks. And that exclusion reverberates in our neighborhoods and communities today. From 1930 to 1970, lots of people moved to Detroit. Blacks, whites, and immigrants all wanted the American dream. It seemed attainable in large thanks to the burgeoning auto industry. But America was still crippled from the effects of the Great Depression. To get the economy going, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt came up with the New Deal. In it, the Federal Housing Act of 1934 provided low-interest, government-backed mortgages to whites only and even subsidize contractors to build new subdivisions as long as they promise not to sell the homes they built to blacks and many times immigrants. So in essence, a white man and black man of the same age, both working at, say, Ford with the same earning potential, could apply for a house in the same neighborhood, but only the white man would likely be approved. The black man was forced to take a house in a black neighborhood or in newly developed housing projects. So to streamline the process, the government and neighborhood associations used tactics such as redlining and restrictive covenants to keep non-whites out. If landlords rented to blacks, they'd charge them more than whites. By the 60s, at the height of the civil rights movement, blacks were fed up, not only with housing discrimination, but systemic police abuse, job discrimination, and other forms of bias. There were demonstrations, protests, and riots in Detroit and other cities across America. Whites started to feel unsafe. They moved and took their equity to the suburbs with them. Most weren't rich by any means, but they could buy better homes, maybe even borrow against their home equity to help their kids go to college. By the time blacks had the opportunity, most couldn't catch up, further widening the wealth gap. And here is the actual deed to a home on Burnett Street on Detroit's west side that spells out in a legally enforceable contract the racial restrictive covenant. I'll read a little bit of it to you right now. It says, in consideration of the mutual covenants contained for the purpose of making and maintaining said subdivision a desirable residence for the Caucasian race, do hereby agree that we will not lease or rent any part of the subdivision to persons not of the Caucasian race, and we restrict the property now now owned in said subdivision to occupancy by persons of the Caucasian race exclusively. And this was in a rider that was still attached to a deed that was issued in? 1952. 1952. We talk about racism often being sort of an unwritten code. Mm -hmm. Turns out it was written too. Right Let's head back to Rhonda and Everard. Wow. Certainly painful to reflect on yeah. that and not being that long ago. Tonight does mark 57 years since Dr. Martin Luther King marched the streets of Detroit with a crowd of over 100,000. He spoke about dreams of equality that, unfortunately, we are still very much struggling to achieve now decades later. And our Paula Tupman joins us now live with a story of one couple 
who was there that day and have continued to risk their lives to pave the way for civil rights and social justice. Paula. Good evening, Rhonda and Everett. I want to show you something. This is a copy of the actual program from that march. And the couple who gifted it to me, they've spent three quarters of their lives freedom fighting and looking for social justice. And at a time when most people their age might be well past retirement, um, they're not ready, not even close. When Martin Luther King Jr. debuted his original I Have a Dream speech in Detroit in 1963, somewhere in that crowd of more than 125,000 freedom marchers was a 22-year-old warrior for civil rights named Dorothy Dewberry. It was a very, very exciting day to uh, be a part. Today she is Dorothy Dewberry Aldridge, and alongside her husband Dan Aldridge, has spent more than six decades fighting for civil rights, equality, and social justice. Fighting to expose police abuse in 1967, when three black teenagers were shot to death at the Algiers Motel. Creating the tribunals to hold police accountable. They weren't doing anything about these three young men that were killed. And the one thing that is immutably clear today, as clear as it was 60 years ago, is they are still in the same fight for the exact same things. Uh, we have wealth disparity. We have housing disparity in the way that people uh, live. Just like now, the issue in 1963 was police brutality. Detroit had uh, what they call a, a, a unit called stress. And what it was, it was used primarily to intimidate the black community, the African American community. They found the biggest most dangerous looking uh, white men they could find and four of them would get in a car and drive around the neighborhood and intimidate people, uh, tell folks uh, if they were standing on the corner, look, give me this corner and I'm going to go around and when I come back, you better not be here. But today the civil rights fight seems different. You've got these video cameras, people got their cell phones, people are taking pictures. Without those pictures, a lot of this stuff doesn't exist. For example, George Floyd, he'd just be dead. I'm angry, and I think uh, folks should have righteous anger about what is going on. People just subconsciously, when they see a black person, they just really cannot handle what they see. The woman with the man with the bird. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. She knew if she called the police and said certain buzz words. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. That she was going to get a certain kind of a response. Now people have a record. They have a picture. They have evidence that at that time it was just your word against theirs. Mm -hmm. Right after the, the George Floyd situation, we saw instances all over the country where the police have been violating people's rights and beating people. Today, they finally have hope for tangible, lasting justice for all. But they believe, like many others, the window is small. The mountain is high. The fight will get harder. But in their late 70s, they are not tired. I still see myself as a young person. You have to be hopeful because either you just, uh, you can't give up. I'm hopeful because I believe we have the power. Now, will, will it hurt? Yes, it will hurt. Will we have to pay some dues? Yes, we will. Will we have to cry? Yes, we will. Will we have to change? Yes. But the key thing is that all of us is changing, and it may be that none of us has the upper hand. Amen. You know, if you're ever at Hart Plaza, it really is worth looking for this plaque commemorating that incredible march, touching those words, reading those words, you know. This couple, as I said, they're not ready to pass the baton. They say they want to hold it hand in hand and share the journey across the finish line with a new generation of freedom fighters. Guys. Incredible. Yeah, so their activism is certainly what makes a difference. Now that they're seeing these new round of protests, Paula, have they gotten out and participated? That's a great question, and I did ask that question. And, of course, Dan has been at the marches. Not Mrs. Aldridge, not Dorothy, but Dan... He is still at it on foot. 
Wow. All right. Well, thank you very much, Paula. We are just getting started here tonight, hearing from all generations on where we can go from here. Absolutely. From the city to the suburbs, I sat down with college and high school students and discovered what they really want to see changed in our school. You got to first teach him to have an open mind. He's got to go at life as if it's not racism. And having the talk with our children, I got a chance to sit down with three dads, three black dads, and ask them how and when they have this difficult conversation with their black sons. And he was a young boy when his father held the walk to freedom here in Detroit. Tonight, Martin Luther King III joins us live to talk about his father's legacy and how we can seize upon the calls for change today. That's next. They say history does nothing but repeats itself. And I think we live in that history all over again. Well, my dream is for my kids and my grandkids to not have to go through any of this, these things in the future. Welcome back. Again, it was today's date, 1963, when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made an impassioned speech here in Detroit that served as a precursor to his famous I Have a Dream speech, which he would later give a few weeks later in Washington, D.C. Dr. King's oldest son is, was only about five years old when his father was here for the Detroit Walk to Freedom. And here we are decades later, and he and his family continue to carry on their father's dream. Joining us live is Martin Luther King III. Thank you so much for staying up late to talk with us here in Detroit. Thank you. Absolutely. The death of George Floyd is, is sadly familiar. We've, we've been seeing these killings happen over and over, but this one seems to really have galvanized not just the nation, but the world in such a way that it feels different. Do you agree? And if so, why does it feel that way? Well, it, uh, it certainly does feel different. If you think about it, 52 years ago, um, and first, let, let me say, it's inhumane to do what that officer did. Uh, whatever humanity that he may have had, he lost when he put his knee on uh, George Floyd's neck and refused to get up to hear a man calling for help and calling for his mother that had been deceased for 18 months, clearly says, he is lost. I, I, don't, I don't even understand how inhumane one could be. Yeah. But I think that 50 years ago, there were black men in Memphis, Tennessee, walking with signs that said, I am a man. And my father was a part of those demonstrations 52 years ago. Basically, what they were saying is, I want dignity. I want respect. I want to be treated like a human being. I wanted to be paid a living wage. And 52 years later, black people and white people and Latino and Hispanic people and others have signs saying Black Lives Matter. We are still demanding, in a sense today, demanding equality, justice, righteousness, demanding to be treated fairly and like human beings. And that's the very tragic part of it. We should be further along, but unfortunately, some of the leadership in our nation has emerged and I'd say some thought that we were past this when President Obama was elected. Yeah. Most black folk didn't think that way, but whites thought that we were in a post-racial period. So when everyone saw George Floyd being killed in an inhumane way, and, he, and just being killed, the whole world, the nation and the world was galvanized. It was almost like, the, you know, some have said the dog whistle concept. You know, how the dogs can hear the, that whistle, we can't. It seems like many, many, many whites all over the world finally heard the pain that black folk have been going through over and over and over again. And they also, along with us, have decided we are not going to accept this anymore. It has to change, and it has to change now. And speaking of change, do you think there will be real change? And if so, give me a few examples of what that change should look like. Well, I think there has to be a structural change. When we talk about systematic racism, yes, we are focusing on police. And police is such a broad segment. There are all kinds of things that have to happen in policing. 
in addition to more community policing, in addition to identifying those who live in the communities and they police the communities that they live in because they understand along with others, because others coming in don't have a context or a clue and still not an understanding. In addition to racial sensitivity, uh, human relations, diversity training over and over and over again, in addition to de-escalating uh, or demilitarizing our police departments, those are some of the things that have to happen as well as abolishing the chokehold. We see legislation being proposed at the federal level, but we are seeing it at the, the local levels. If we look at the fact that Minnesota or Minneapolis is talking about abolishing the police department and starting over again, well, some people say, oh, that's frightening. Look at Camden, New Jersey. That's what they did. It's a great example. They uh, abolished, abolished that whole department, started over, hired new police and some who were still there. And now the crime is lower. It doesn't mean the community totally trusts police yet, but what it means is that there have been dramatic changes. As crime is going down, policing is different. If Camden can do it, then other cities can do it. Not every city has to do it, but many do have to make dramatic changes. And we got to find a way to ultimately abolish racism. My dad was trying to abolish what he called were well, the triple evils of poverty, racism, and violence in our society. Yeah. And clearly, racism continues to reel its ugly head. Indeed. And we have got to work on that. But it needs to be in the corporate levels, corporate boardrooms, equity, inclusion, and diversity. And they're not just talking about it. You got to do it. It's got to reflect from the top to the bottom. I think that we're going to see more corporate board seats. I think you're going to see more CEOs. I mean, we have four black CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. In 2020, we're 14% of the population. Sure. So we need to have certainly many more, and we should, and actually we can almost demand that, in fact. But not just at the top, all the way throughout the organizations. Yeah. I only have about 20 seconds. I want to ask you, what do you think your father would think about the movement, and especially the violence? My father said riots are the language of the unheard. So while he never condoned violence, he understood why people resorted to violence. And so that's the first thing. He would, he would be empathetic, but he would want us to, to, to work on a nonviolent approach as well. So that's, that's, that's the, essentially the answer. Yeah. Martin, we thank you so much for being with us and staying up late and talking to our viewers here in Detroit. We appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Coming up, he's a Detroit teacher who found a new purpose in life when he realized black children lacked role models in the classrooms. Our Victor Williams shows us how he's working to change that in just a moment. And it's a difficult conversation that black families are having, including mine. And up next, three dads are sharing what it's like and why it's so important. Keep it here. Do you remember what age they were when you had the first conversation with them about race? I think it was when Jackson was in third grade. Mm -hmm. So he was nine. I don't want to hear that white people are uncomfortable anymore. We are living in discomfort every day. It is not comfortable for us to tell our 14-year-old sons that they can't go out and be 14-year-old boys. To say that you don't see color is actually offensive because you need to acknowledge that we all have differences. It's just a matter if there are racist differences mm -hmm. and not acknowledging that our experience in this country is very different than that of a white American. Those interviews are from a story I did a few weeks ago with three local mothers raising black children. They were very candid about how they have to talk to their children about race and what they want all parents to know about having the talk with their own children. Everod, you did the same with local fathers to get their perspective on these tough conversations. Yeah, it was a tough conversation, Kimberly. Now it's the dad's turn because it's honestly just very difficult to watch what's happening to black men in our country. And as a young black man myself, my parents taught me about some of the things that people would think about me and how the world would view me and the things that I should do in hopes of staying safe. And now at some point, I'll have to have that conversation with my sons. They're biracial, and it's a conversation that a lot of black parents have had to have with their black sons. So I sat down with three black fathers about how and when they have this difficult conversation with theirs. 
Three black fathers open up. Chris Brooks, a father of six and local pastor. Lucas Haggerty, a master scheduler with Hall Light Seals Americas and father of three. And Herb Harris Jr., a local musician and father of two. They all spoke candidly with me about the challenges or differences raising black or biracial young men in today's climate compared to their white counterparts. What are some things that you have found in your life as a black man that you've been either taught by your parents or that you've learned that you have to do differently in the way that you approach different scenarios in life? Yeah, I think for me, it's just realizing that the assumption of guilt is often there, uh, that the profile that uh, I fit just by way of my ethnicity, by way of my skin color, often causes there to be an assumption of guilt. Immediately when you asked that, I thought about the many times I've gone into stores and casually I want to put my hand in my pockets, but I'm terrified to even, you know, really even entertain that thought. Yeah, don't, don't bring attention to yourself. Why is that? Because if you bring attention to yourself and then it's a reason to pull you over, then you get a harassment that you could have avoided possibly with not having the music loud or something. Uh, unfortunately, there's a sense that the more casual we dress, the more explaining we have to do that we're not criminals, that we haven't done anything to break the law. Is that fair? Not at all. Um, I mean, at this point, I, I, it is what it is. Yeah, the world isn't fair. You said you've been called the N-word. Yeah. Have you been called the N-word? Yeah. Have you been called the N-word? Yeah. Wow. When your child comes to you for the first time and they tell you, Dad, somebody's called me the, the N-word, what, what do you tell them? That's not who you are. What someone else says about you does not define you. How do you teach your son what he needs to learn to survive in, in this country knowing that he's biracial? Uh, you got to first teach him to have an open mind. He's got to go at life as if it's not racism, but in the back of his mind, he has to know it is because he can be profiled just because of me. And before you act on anything, reaching for your wallet, the glove compartment, make sure you are telling the officer exactly what you're doing, getting permission to do it, and don't act until they give you that verbal permission. Understand that you treat people with respect and sometimes bad things will, will happen. People will make choices that negatively affect you but maintain your sense of who you are. We got, uh, you know, no sagging rule in our family anyway. Uh, but Mine too. <laughs> the conversation started when their son started asking questions or as certain incidents like George Floyd have made headlines. And as they pass along these so-called survival skills, these fathers have hope that one day things will change yeah. for the better. Yeah, I have tremendous hope. First off, because of my relationship with Christ, that gives me hope, my faith. But I also have hope because of the history of this country. Whenever we have had conversations like this, hard, tough conversations about the brokenness of our structures and our systems, we've improved those systems. And I have hope as well. And I pray that each and every one of you at home have hope too. These black fathers have also found it important to show their children by example to have diverse relationships with others. We posted their full conversation on our website. You can go to clickindetroit.com for that. It's right there on the home page. And then tomorrow morning, we have part two of the conversation with the dads. Kimberly? Yeah, nice, Ev brought in. And I heard a similar sentiment from the three mothers that I spoke with uh, and having diverse relationships. So important for everyone, uh, yeah. not just black children, but everyone. Otherwise, it makes us all uh, the more difficult to understand each other and have empathy for what others go through. But great conversation. Devin. Uh, we we're going to turn our focus to education next. We'll meet a Detroit teacher trying to make a big impact in the classroom with who he's trying to recruit into the teaching field. Plus. You know, people look up to police to protect them, you know, save them and help them. It's like, how do we get to a place where everybody is afraid? And it was just kind of crazy because if this many people are fighting for this, I don't know why it hasn't already changed.
A powerful lesson from our youth on what needs to change. Frustration and uneasiness. The feeling of being overwhelmed. Just anger. A lot of people have anger that they don't know where to put. Fear is definitely another emotion. Fear, anger, frustration, the feelings of our children. I sat down with eight local high school and college students, ages 14 to 18, from the inner city to the suburbs, black and white, to talk about the racial equality movement right now. And they have so much in common. They believe attention and exposure to racial diversity initiatives is needed in school, along with better education about race and the African-American side of American history, past and present. They also believe they shoulder and they should have some of the responsibility, our educators, and that happens in school. Learn the history of this country, um, the accurate history. There's almost a complete erasure of African-American history um, in the curriculum. Just know the roots and what this country is built upon, which is honestly the blood, sweat, and tears of Native Americans and of black people. Yeah, hey, I completely agree. It's 2020, you can educate yourself. You, you can dig, you know, we're learning European history, and, you know, all, all that stuff is great, but we need to really get into the American history so we can understand and be more empathetic for different groups of people. Um, it's a lot of things that we don't know, which I feel um, affects how we interact with other diverse groups of people. I think it's time that we learn some of our own black history to kind of express that confidence that we should have. Black history is probably a bigger subject in a predominantly black school, but I don't know. Yeah, no. It's, it's <laughs> uh, not. I feel that's a big problem that um, you know contributes to the racial divide. And in the textbooks, we're referred to as savages and rebels and stuff like that. And I'm like, what is going on? You know? And we're programmed to learn that and respect that because that's what we're being taught. And there's a gap in the education and conversation about race and racism in predominantly white schools too. Which is kind of scary to hear, I guess. We haven't really been um, focusing on it too much, which is. We should be. We learn about Martin Luther King Jr. and about Rosa Parks, but we don't really learn about the stuff that's happening right now. If you don't have a family that's going to try to push that initiative for you, you're not going to know. For me, I'm just now learning about that there was a black Wall Street. Like, and I learned it from my granddad. I'm like, Black Wall Street, what? Before the Black Lives Mo um, Matter movement happened, uh, you know, people weren't even w willing to talk about Black Lives Matter or Black Lives in general. Do you think educators need to do more to help to educate on race relations and, and, and history better? I for sure think that. I had one teacher sophomore year that was so influential. Like we talked about like this movement for so long and it was very powerful. I walked away from that class, like just having my mind like blown off. Of but that was just one teacher, her entire school year. The kids want other teachers to know what can happen when you teach beyond outdated textbooks. My African-American teacher, she was like, you know, okay, yeah, we're gonna do projects on the people with police brutality, but I want you to research the people who, you know, didn't have all the news, it didn't have all the headlights, but you don't have a lot of teachers like that that teach outside the box. Protests and demonstrations have also been learning experiences for our youth. Cameron and Nigel have helped lead huge demonstrations of all races, cultures, and ages recently in Berkeley, Troy, and Birmingham. We wanted to bring the protests to the suburbs. 14-year-old Zoe Granger and her family sought out that exposure in Ferndale, joining a Black Lives Matter protest of nearly a thousand people. People my age could go to them and it would just be helpful to learn, be a learning experience. What impact did that experience have on you? I didn't really realize how many people were fighting for this. And it was just kind of crazy because if this many people are fighting for this, I don't know why it hasn't already changed. was one of the more profound responses that I heard there. But these kids, they talked about the clubs and groups for racially diverse kids at school, how right. important those are, and so much more. We talked about Black Lives Matter, what it means to them. We talked about white privilege, what that means to them, and so much more. So incredible hearing their perspective of things. Oh, it is. It is eye-opening, especially for educators out there. You can hear my entire conversation with all of these eight students. We have put it on our website at clickondetroit.com. It's right there on the home page, and it is definitely worth watching. Kim, Deverly? There is uh, children of color who have uh, at least one teacher of the same race.
have a higher chance of success in life. They're more likely to graduate, more likely to go to college. But a recent report from New Detroit suggests Michigan teachers don't reflect the demographics of their students. Local 4's Victor Williams introduces us to one teacher trying to change that. Victor. Yeah, that's right. This is a man straight from the heart of Detroit who has been involved in the education system since the late 90s as a volunteer that later on actually started as an official teacher in the early 2000s. But one thing he's noticed on his journey is that there aren't too many people that look like me in the classroom. And for the sake of our children, that really needs to change. The main thing is, is that we want to impress on black men that you are needed. Detroit teacher Quan Nellums is an educator seen on multiple platforms that's now hoping to encourage more men of color to step into the classroom. You know, being involved in education, um, um, in the field of education as black men, uh, it definitely has a revolutionizing effect. Nellums discovered his newfound purpose in life when he realized black children, especially young boys, have little to no role models in school that look like them. Men are 2% of the teaching population in the, in the nation. But what we do know with those small numbers is that men have a, a deepening impact on the school culture. You know, black children, when they have representation in the classroom, when they see themselves and their teachers, they tend to uh, come to school more. They tend to, uh, you know, attendance improves. As a younger educator, Nellums has been able to use the art of hip hop to get through to his students. His after school program is called the Lyricist Society. Today is history, tomorrow's a mystery. So let's do Utilizing that, um, it gives students a chance to see the brilliance behind something cultural that they listen to and are involved in on a daily basis. He also created the organization called In Demand, where the aim is for older black men to make a positive impact on the future leaders of tomorrow in the African-American community, for it's going to take all hands on deck to really make a difference. Being involved in the lives of young people needs to be a part of every black man's lifestyle. You know, we definitely need to have representation in the spirit of education. And on July 11th, Mr. Nellisms, excuse me, Mr. Nellums, his organization and demand will be having a event over at the Durfee Athletic Field to recruit more African-American teachers. Reporting live tonight, Victor Williams, Local 4. Back to you. Fascinating. Absolutely. All right, Victor, we've got more to come here tonight. We do. Meet brothers using their business to mentor young people in the community. And next, my conversation on race. Two generations, very familiar faces in Metro Detroit. What we can all do next to, uh, to go from talking about change to making it happen. Welcome back. We've watched a wide spectrum of faces at the protests in Detroit, including those who have marched the paths so many times before and those for whom the journey is relatively new. Very happy to be joined now by the head of the Detroit branch of the NAACP, the Reverend Wendell Anthony, and a new face many Detroiters now recognize, Stefan Perez, who found himself the leader of several protests in the city. Uh, Reverend Anthony, let me start with you. I've known you for many years. I, you've had uh, many, many heartbreaks over the years. I'm wondering if right now you feel like what we're seeing is finally different. I do, Devin, and um, let me just say, um, I appreciate the fact that uh, we have these young people who are engaged. Uh, I'm inspired uh, by what I see. I want them to continue uh, to keep the pressure on. But we must move just not only from, from marching um, to marching towards the coast, marching towards policy. Uh, you know, when Dr. King and civil rights workers and freedom fighters were marching, they had an end game. The end game was policy changing. Yeah. We must change the policies in health care and criminal justice reform. That's why we've been working on some reforms that we're going to present uh, uh, to the legislative body and the governor this week. Uh, that's very essential. So while I'm I see the diversity of the marches, black, white, uh, Arab, Christian, Jew, uh, whatever, Hispanic, in terms of those coming together, that's encouraging. And it's encouraging to see them marching in suburban communities in communities where white folk live, because whites need to see and hear other whites speak to them about the issues. So I'm enthusiastic, but I would be even more if we turn the protest to practical reality, and that's going to take your souls to the polls and voting. Hmm. Uh, Stefan, I, I, if you don't have idealism in you when you're young, then your youth is probably being wasted on you. I'm going to assume that you really are feeling uh, the capacity for change that you'll see in your lifetime. Yeah, um, it's just 
you know, we all got to come together, uh, different generations uh, and different, you know, all that type of ethnicity, such as Reverend said, um, all come together as a unity. Um, one thing that we make mistakes that I realized that um, somebody actually gave me a type of input on is like a video game. You know, you wake up and you play that video game all day and you keep on ending right there at the middle. And you don't got no video game cartridge, you know? So instead of saving the game, you got to shut the game off because it's bedtime. <laughs> Wake up the next day and start that video game all over instead of just continuing from that checkpoint. And I think that's what we do in every generation that is uh, seated behind us is, you know, we let them lead and then we like, okay, old timer, it's our time. And then we do the same thing, and then it just keeps on happening, but we never get to no change, which is, and the only change that we do get is usually temporary. So I figure now, you know, it's time that we put in that game cartridge, like, you know what, I'm going to start where we left off, and we're going to continue to make sure we get to the end. Wendell, you've never compared it to a video game to me before, so there's already a difference. <laughs> Let me ask you both this, though. Um, I think, Wendell, that we have had, we've sort of, a lot of people have hoped that each, with each generation, we see some improvement. Each generation a little yeah. less racist than the one that preceded. Do you sense that that's true, or is that just something that particularly white people like to tell ourselves to try to point to some kind of progress? Well, I hope that it is not, and I think I hope it's more than that, uh, Deb. And let me just say this. One of the hopes that I have is, and what the young man just indicated, it's not either or generation, it's both and. You need the wisdom and knowledge of those who have come before you, and you need the strength and the energy of the young who are coming behind you. When you put those two things together, you got something that's good. The difference that I see today is that this thing has taken on a worldwide character. It has taken on something that we've not seen before, uh, and it is still increasing. You've seen criminal justice reforms that are being made. You've seen uh, uh, governors and states call for an end to chokeholds and uh, engage uh, police officers to turn each other in and to stop them uh, from uh, yeah. abusing people on the street. So I think there's hope there, but the real hope comes in the policies. What happens? in the reforms that we make. I yeah. think Stefan and all of those want to see reforms. That's what we want to see is reforms. St Stefan, I, I, those reforms I know are important to you. We've heard you talk about those on our newscast. Give me your take, though, Stefan, on generationally speaking. What do you see about in, in, in the people your age? There's no doubt that there are still another group of those who are racist who are coming in um, behind this generation, too, but hopefully not as many. What do you see? Stephanie, did we lose you? There you are. Sorry, I apologize. No, no, sorry. Somebody keeps on calling me. I put my phone on. <laughs> of course. <laughs> You're a popular guy, these guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, generations coming together. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, in fact, we're, we're, we're having a little bit of trouble, obviously, with Stefan Signal. Uh, but he has obviously been a, a, a face and a voice that we're going to hear from a lot more. Uh, we, our thanks to him. Wendell, thank you so much for your time, and I hope we'll see you again soon. Stay safe. Thank you, Devin. You bet, Kimberly. Call on his phone. His friends are. All right, well, there are lots of conversations about race going on across our community and how we can all help move forward in a positive direction. Larry Spruill introduces us to two brothers who mentor youngsters, and Larry, they're answering a lot of tough questions right now. Well, Kimberly and Devin, they are answering those questions with the young men that they mentor, but they're also addressing those issues on social media as well. But just like they're answering their questions, they have a lot of questions of their own. Like, how do we have this conversation during such a dark time? How can we have hope and move forward? And lastly, how can we have this conversation in a positive direction? GPS has played a great role in uh, upbringing and who I am as a man today. Brothers Daryl and Decoven Humes are proud products of Detroit Public Schools. Now grown men, they use their love of fashion as owners of Mature Men's Clothing Store in New Center, Detroit, to educate others about the role clothes can play in making a good first impression. It's bigger than just two black brothers that are business owners. They volunteer and mentor kids in single parent homes between the ages of 8 and 23. Young kids that are growing up with a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainties and a lot of 
lack of confidence. Stretch fit shirt does for athletic men. The Humes brothers recognize in some situations, no matter what you wear, those who hate still would not respect you. But they made a huge effort to focus their energy on what they can do to make things better for their families and others. This is something that we all inherit. The people that started this whole race thing, racism, are all gone. So what are we going to do to make the change on something that we all inherit? And the Humes brothers tell me they also rely heavily on their faith and their family, but they also say that the conversation must continue, not just with your loved ones and your friends, but also with your coworkers and the one you interact with on a daily basis. As long as we continue having this conversation, they're hopeful that things will change for the better. We're live at City Hall tonight. Larry Sproul, Local 4. All right, Larry, thank you. We'll be right back to wrap things up. I'm still right there for you. I hope we've given you a lot to think about tonight. And as we leave, I'm curious, it takes a lot to put a, produce a program like this, a lot of heavy lifting in our minds. And I'm wondering what is, we were all left with to think about. Everod, what struck you and has resonated with you over this last hour? You know, one thing that I will say is, is love. If we can all take the love that we have in our hearts and express that towards each and every person, love not just your, your family members, but your friends, people that don't look like you, and, and find a way to love each other and live in harmony. Yeah. Rhonda, how about you? Absolutely. Just to... I, I was thinking be kind, be accepting, be more understanding. And I was certainly inspired by our next generation. Those kids <laughs> I talked to, young activists, they're going to be our change makers. And I think yeah. we have a very hopeful future ahead. KG, how about you? I, I agree with everything that you guys have said and also that it takes us all. This is not just a black problem. It is our problem and it's our, we should all be uh, focused on, on trying to solve it. So. Well, I'm thinking about what Wendell Anthony just said about policy change. It, otherwise, it ends up being like what Mark Twain said about the weather. Everybody talks about it. Nobody does anything about it. Thank you so much for spending this evening with us. Up next, Local 4 News at 11.